One of the things about internal medicine that really has frustrated me the most is how much I don't know, how much I absolutely don't know about things, about people, about human beings, about biology. And I know what studies say, and I know what drugs are supposed to do, but it's just, there's so many things people will say. How come when I lay on my right side, my eyelid twitches? Yeah. My, I, go, I, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, sometimes you do knock it out of the park. You know, you say, okay, that makes sense. But a lot of times you're going, I, you know, I don't know. But I, I mean, um, think in our own clinical lifetimes, I mean, you know, I, I got my MD in 75. I mean, there's diseases that within 10 years, Lyme disease, you think we knew about Lyme disease in 75? HIV coming into the 80s, what, these people were losing their, their white blood counts and you're going, well, what is that? You know, just think, and, just, and then, you know, in my own field with the, the imaging, I'm old enough that we didn't have CAT scans. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, we were doing skull x-rays and maybe angiography, or even worse, pneumoencephalography. And so I, I was studying in, in London, and you know, in the 73, the CAT scans go, oh my God, look at this thing. The pixels were a si the size of checkers, but you're going, whoa. And then they come up with the MRI. I mean, the, the technology, uh, you know, but now you're getting get this stuff thrown at you with so much data, you're saying, well, now can I get some signal extract some signal from all that noise. And we're constantly trying to do that. Look at literature, we get overwhelmed with literature. So what's the signal? What is germane to me to help a given patient? And presumably we're lifelong learners and we're supposed to know how to do it, but it doesn't get easier. No, no. Einstein supposedly had skull x-rays and he supposedly had an EEG somewhere. Are they around? And that probably, I don't know if that was the topic of the conversation when, when, when Harvey was pitching it to, to, the, to the sun, but Einstein was a good friend with a radiologist named Gustav Bucky. And Bucky, I got a feeling that Bucky developed one of those filters that, for x-rays that, that um, oh, the collimators of Bucky, yeah, the guy was brilliant. And, and he did a skull x-ray of Einstein. It was sold by auction for, I don't know, got, you know, $10,000 more, who knows. <laughs> But so I, I don't think, you know, I think Bucky probably said, well, let's just get, a, let's just get an x-ray of your skull. And Einstein said, okay, let's go along with it. And then the other one was in the 50s, 51, um, some guys out of um, EEG was a, you know, was a eight lead, uh, you know, primitive machines. But, but they, the guys at Mass General had him and also uh, another resident genius at the Institute for Advanced Study, Johnny von Neumann, they did EEGs on these guys. And the great anecdotal story, which I, again, I think is in the book, is um, usually when you and I are confronted, if you're doing an EEG, if we're relaxed, you got an alpha rhythm, eight to 12 cycles per second, you know, okay. Um, but if you get disrupted, like, uh, you, you know, uh, what's the square root of two, it goes away. The alpha rhythm goes away, you got other rhythms, beta rhythms or something like that. But Einstein supposedly, when he was working on a problem, he went into alpha. <laughs> He's in the alpha. And then all of a sudden they're recording him. And this Wilder Penfield mentions this. He says, uh, all of a sudden the alpha disappeared. Einstein was sort of in his reverie. And, and, and they go, well, what happened, professor? And the guy says, I realized I, left, I made a mistake on some calculations. And, and it, it was obviously jarring him. And now he lost his alpha rhythm. But where you and I, alpha is sort of what you go into before you go to sleep. That was sort of his standard rhythm when he was dealing with these abstruse problems. So, you know, that's fascinating stuff. And God knows EEG is a, an incredibly important field. But in terms of cognition, I think, I think you know, EEG is a great study for things like epilepsy and maybe certain types of coma. But you're dealing with so many neurons it would be like flying over a city and looking at all the city lights and trying to see how they're blinking and then trying to guess how they voted in the last election. <laughs> you just, you're not going to get that information. It's pretty interesting stuff. You may get some information, but, um, but anyway, Einstein did go for that. So possibly, you know, as a thoughtful, introspective guy, he really did wonder what was going on between his ears. I'll tell you an interesting Einstein story. Um, yeah. He used to ride the dinky, I guess, to go places when he would lecture. And yeah. 
the train man came by and found him on the, on the floor, uh, rooting around <laughs> on the floor. And they said, Dr. Einstein, what are you doing? And he said, uh, I lost my ticket. And they said, well, don't worry about your ticket. We know who you are. Don't, just, don't, just forget it. So he sat down, and the train man went up the train, and he comes back. Einstein is back on the floor, still looking for that ticket. And he said, Professor Einstein, don't worry about it. I told you we know who you are, and don't worry about it. He said, look, I know you know who I am, and I know who I am, but I don't know where I'm going, and I have to find that <laughs> ticket. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story, but that sounds like something Einstein would I say. I wish someone would assemble those more, because those, you know, there's a lot of these stories floating around Princeton about him doing kids' homework and yeah. plumbing, doing the plumbing in his neighbor, uh, uh, Eric Rogers' house next to him. Yeah, he, I think he was uh, written, this is not a biography. It's a biography of brain, but just spending some time with him. I think he was a really great guy. I met a man, a woman who played piano with him. She was about 90 and she played the piano with him and said he was not a very good fiddle player, a violin <laughs> player. I, <coughs> but it was the passion that he had and he, he did, did have that knob on his brain, didn't he? Yes, he did. The, the, uh, the cortical, the omega sign in, in his right frontal lobe, and that's in the book, and you can Google that. If you look up the omega sign, String players, because they're doing more detailed fret work with the left hand, they will have this cortical, this, this primary motor cortex strip, you'll have this little bump in it that they call the omega sign. Now, whether you develop that or you're born with it, and that's what makes you a violin player, no one knows.